Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lambda School's mini boot camp. This is lesson three. So if you are joining us for the first time, we are on the third lesson of our mini boot camp. The other two lessons are posted on YouTube, so you can go and check those out. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about some slightly more advanced CSS positioning topics. So if you are brand new to CSS, it might be good to check out yesterday's lesson. If you have some familiar, familiarity with it already, then go ahead and sit in and you can catch up on the other lessons later. So before we get started on learning more about CSS, let me give you the spiel about what is Lambda School and what is this boot camp. And by the way, for those of us joining, for those of you joining us, I am Deandra Ryan Moss and I am an instructor here at Lambda School. So Lambda School is a computer science immersive and web development school. So it's a six month curriculum where we get you from essentially a beginner to the point where you are ready to be hired on the workforce as a computer programmer. So a lot of what we teach is web development oriented. We teach you about front end JavaScript, back end JavaScript, a ton of front end frameworks. Um, we also have a project that you work on so that you have a web app that you put together to showcase to potential employers. And then we switch our focus over to a more computer science oriented curriculum as well. So you're learning a lot of everything, really all the skills that you're gonna need to know. And along the way, there's a really diverse schedule. So it is a full-time program, but it's definitely not us lecturing you eight hours a day, five days a week. We, ha we do have live lectures and live Q and A's. There are also coding challenges. There's time set aside for you to work on homework and projects. There's pair programming time. So we give you a really well-rounded experience to get you to be the best programmer that you possibly can be. And we are so confident in our curriculum that we actually have a de-risked education model, which means that we don't require you to pay anything upfront. We are confident that we can get you that full-time computer programming job afterwards. So we will let you pay us back over your first couple years on the job force. So that is really great because we can choose who comes to Lambda School based on who is dedicated, who wants to learn, not based on who has money right now. So that's Lambda School. And this is the mini boot camp, which is a totally free three course uh, lesson on web development. So we really introduce you to all the topics that you're gonna be learning in detail throughout the main curriculum. And if you're interested in applying to the main curriculum, we always prioritize applicants who have gone through this boot camp because it really shows us that you are serious and dedicated to learning this material. Well, let's go ahead and actually jump into learning some things about CSS. So yesterday we were introduced to the basics of both HTML and CSS. And HTML and CSS are two of the core languages for front end web development. They allow us to create what you see on screen when you go to a website. So we learned that HTML creates the actual elements on the screen. So if there's text, headers, images, links, buttons, anything that's actually on the screen, that's going to be built using HTML. And we saw a little bit of that yesterday, and hopefully you guys did your homework last night and are now HTML writing experts. We also learned about CSS, which is style. So whereas HTML is what is on the screen, CSS is how does that look? So anything from colors to positioning to background, that's all going to be done in CSS. So we saw a few things in CSS yesterday. We learned how to change some colors, um, pretty basic things like that, add borders. We learned about margins and padding. But today we're gonna talk about the thing that makes CSS truly powerful and sometimes truly frustrating, which is positioning. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys, one second. All right, up here I have a blank code pen for us. And as we learned, code pen is a sandbox environment, which is a really easy way for us to just jump in and start writing HTML and CSS code. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw a few elements on the screen. So I am going to create a div. 
And inside of that, maybe a paragraph. And a span. And those have some very descriptive text inside of them. So, of course, over here on our web page, we can see the word paragraph and the word span appear, but it's not totally clear where the element actually lies. So, let me go ahead and throw some CSS on there to make it really clear. So, I'm going to select all paragraphs and give them a background color. And then I'm going to select all spans and give them a background color of let's do, purple. All right, so now we can see where the entire element lies. So, let, so we can see that the paragraph is extending all the way across the screen, whereas the span is just this small little box that contains the text. The reason this is happening is because there is built-in style within every single HTML element. So paragraphs have some built-in styling. Spans have some built-in styling. We also saw this a little bit with our headings yesterday. As I mentioned yesterday, we want to think about the number in the heading tag as denoting importance. But what we obviously see on screen is that it also affects the size of the text. Once again, that is some built-in styling. Now, while there is built-in styling, we always have the power to overwrite it in CSS. And in fact, in a real-world situation, you usually actually want to wipe the slate clean, get rid of all of that built-in styling so that you can start fresh when you're writing your CSS. But it's a good way to illustrate some of the properties that we're going to explore today. So the first thing I want to talk about is display. So spans and paragraphs do a really good job of already showing us a couple different ways that display can function. So the display property can be set to block, for example. So paragraphs default to block. So if I went ahead and said display block on paragraph, it's not going to change anything because I've just stated what's already the default. So what a block display means is that it takes up the entire line. So the block display is why we see that the blue background extends all the way to the edge. Another display property is called inline. Spans are defaulted to inline. So as we can see when I add this, once again, it doesn't do anything because the span is already set to inline. As you might have guessed, inline is what causes the span to only take up as much space as needed. And as we saw yesterday, we can also create multiple spans and they will sit next to each other on the line. Whereas if we created multiple paragraphs, there's a new line every single time we create them. So as I mentioned, right now the CSS I have written is totally redundant. We're just explicitly stating what is already implicit in each of these elements. But that's not very interesting, right? So let's try and customize a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and throw an ID on the second paragraph. And as we learned yesterday, IDs are a way to denote specific elements. So IDs, as opposed to classes, can only apply to one element. So I couldn't go ahead and throw this ID on anything else on the page. But it'll allow us to select just paragraph two. So let's get rid of those. And I am going to use the hash to select my P2 ID. And then I am going to change display from, we don't want block, because that's what it's already set to. Instead, I'm going to change it to inline. Now, all of a sudden, it has the same display properties that we're used to seeing in spans. It's um, the background is only fitting just the text 
and now we're allowed to have it on the same line as other elements. So let's do the same thing with our second span. So I'm going to give this an ID of S2, and I can select it down here. And of course, display inline won't do anything because spans are auto set to inline. But if I change it instead to display block, now it's behaving like a paragraph. It's on a new line and the background is taking up the entire width of the screen. So you might be wondering to yourself, why in the world would we do this, right? If I want an element that just takes up the width of the screen, shouldn't I make it a paragraph? Or vice versa, if I want something that's going to sit uh, next to other elements and not take up the width, why would I make it a paragraph? That's what spans do. Well, in a simple example like this, you're absolutely right. And you do want to mindfully choose which elements you're using based on their properties. Uh, there's no need to write extra CSS. And we, in general, never want to write extra code that's not really doing anything. So if it would be as simple as changing the P to a span and then getting rid of this CSS, that might be a lot simpler than what I've done up here. But keep in mind that when you're building a real life production, website, you're going to have lots of different elements on page. You're going to have lots of different classes, lots of things within things. There's a lot of complexity that goes on with CSS when you get into a real complex website. So there are situations where it makes sense to change the display like this rather than changing the elements. On top of that, as I said before, in the real world, we like to just wipe clean all these auto settings so that we can build everything from scratch and make sure that we have full control over things like display. So I just showed you two of the most common display types, which is block and inline. There are two more that I wanna mention before we go on. The first is display none, which does exactly what you think. Uh, that paragraph has all but disappeared. In fact, the span has moved over. It's not even hidden on screen. It's, it's as if it's completely gone. And this one also often begs the question of, wait, why would you want to do this? Why even write an element if you're going to do display none? Once again, this is something that might not make sense in our simple example here, but becomes useful in big production code bases. So oftentimes you have an element that might be on the screen sometimes or on the screen other times. For example, if you have form validation and you want the user to get feedback, like a red notice that says, hey, you entered an incorrect email, you don't want that to be displaying all the time. It would probably have a display none most of the time until someone entered in text. So this is something that we're going to see the utility of later down the road when we start to work in JavaScript. But right now, just know that it exists. The next display property I want to briefly mention is called display flex. This display property is so awesome, but it's so complicated that we are going to actually get to it at the end of the lesson. So sit tight, don't let the suspense be too much. You will learn all about display flex, but right now we're gonna move on from it and talk instead about positioning. All right. Let's get rid of that. Okay. So let's talk about a few different positions that we can do. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up this different code pen. So just to fill you in on what I've created in this code pen, I have these three divs called first, second, and third. And then down here in the CSS, I've just gone ahead and given them a height and width of 100 so that we can actually see them. And then I have set each of them has a tag or has an ID, and so I have set the background color to purple, red, and green. And then finally, I've created this child div inside of the third one, but right now it doesn't have a color, so we can't even really see it, but we'll get to this child later. All right, so essentially we're working with first, second, and third div. And as we saw with the spans in the paragraphs, things tend to have default values for display, and it's exactly the same for position. So our default for position is something called um, static. 
So if I add the CSS in here, once again, it's not going to do anything because we've just explicitly stated what elements already are by default. So static position for all intents and purposes just means it's kind of stuck where it is, uh, it's stationary. So that one's not too interesting, but let's start to mess with some of the other ones. The next one is relative. So when I add the position of relative, at first glance, it doesn't seem like anything happened. Um, and from the get-go, relative doesn't do anything, but it, it allows us to have a little more control over our elements. So down here, if I want to start to move around that first purple element, I can now change. There are um, several properties called top, bottom, left, right. And I can go ahead and tweak those. So if I say left, let's do 30 pixels, it shifts over. And if I did bottom, 20 pixels, now it's shifting up. And I want to show you what happens when I do top instead. It shifts down, but notice that the other elements stay where they are. So if I change this back to static, these properties don't do anything. Static stays exactly where it is, even if you add these properties on top. But when I change it to relative, now I'm allowed to individually tweak each, um, each position based on if I'm coming from the left, right, top, bottom, et cetera. So when we want some flexibility in where we're putting our elements, we always have to put on position relative. So let's look at another one called fixed. Get rid of these for a minute. So fixed, at first glance, it looks like we've just lost all of our elements. But the real thing that happened is that they're all stacked on top of each other. So all three are stacked on top of each other right here. So there was actually some positioning logic going on with static and with relative, which is at the very least, there was some default logic that told the elements not to be on top of each other. But when we go ahead and change position to fixed, they all just start in the corner right here. So now let me go ahead and move those around so we can confirm that they are all actually there. So if I move the first one to the left, 50 pixels, we can see it starting to peek out. And let's move this one down, let's say 100 pixels. Now we can see it. And if I did 500, there it is. So this value is with respect to this corner up here. It's moved 300 pixels down from the corner. If I change this back to, um, if I change this back to relative, now the purple ones moved with respect to that corner. Let me actually put these guys back for just a second. So it's really clear what's going on. So the purple one has moved over with respect to that corner. The second one is defaulted right below. But if I went ahead and said top 100 pixels, now it's moved down from that position. In fact, it's hiding behind the green one. And if I move the green one left 30 pixels, it's moving based on that position. So relative, as the name suggests, moves them with respect to some relative position, whereas fixed moves them with respect to this fixed position of the corner. All right, let's talk about another one, which is called absolute. So absolute is a little more complicated. Actually, before we get into that, let me go ahead and put some of these things back. All right, so I have set the position back to relative, which means they're in their default places of stacked, but if I want to, we can toggle them pretty easily. Um, and then I am going to go ahead and bring this child into the world. That sounds a lot more dramatic than what's actually happening here. Um, okay, so child, let's go ahead and make the child a little smaller than its parent. 
and give it a background color of blue. I wanted a height. There we go. So this child element is now on the screen and it is going to be, its position is relative because we have set all divs to relative and right now it's hanging out in the corner of its parent element. So this last, um, this last position that I'm going to show you is called absolute and it can only go on a child. So I'm going to go ahead and change position to absolute. And this is a good chance to find you guys that this element right now has two position values on it. The first one is the one that comes from the div because it's a div. And the second one comes from the child ID. And as we talked about last night, this one is going to override the other one because we always prioritize um, properties that are set onto IDs in, over, um, over just an element selector. So right now this thing's position is set to absolute. And just setting it that way didn't really seem to do a whole lot. But let me mess around with this and I'll show you what happens. Oh, and one other thing to mention is that if the parent is static, position absolute doesn't work. So you always set position absolute on a child of an element that is not static. This is all in the docs. I know it's a lot to memorize. Okay, so I'm going to start to move around the parent element. So we see that the child went with it. Let's go ahead and take this off for a minute. That didn't seem to affect that, so Absolute's doing something else. Now let's try moving around the child. So if I do pop, it went ahead and moved with respect to where the parent is. And in fact, if I move the parent back, we still see that the child is exactly 30 pixels down. And that seems kind of intuitive, right? I mean, the child should hang out in the parent, but it turns out that that's not the default. Or I thought it wasn't the default. Ooh, that was strange. One second, guys. Sorry about this. Well, apparently I have spaced exactly how uh, <laughs> exactly how absolute works, but what a good chance for us to practice Googling. So we can go ahead and do absolute position, CSS, and W3 schools pops up. And look, everything we just learned is here except sticky, which we will not go over today. And if we go down to position absolute, it says is positioned relative to the nearest position ancestor instead of the viewport like fixed. That is what I thought it did, but I can't seem to get it to do anything interesting over here in CodePen. Let's try making the parent this is the pen I want. Let's try making the parent um, not static, but fixed instead. Child. And we'll move the parent down a little bit. Interesting. 
Well, I'm having trouble getting position absolute to do anything interesting on here to demonstrate how it works. But the idea of it is that instead of being relative to, for example, the top axis, um, the position of absolute allows the child to be positioned with respect to the parent. So if we toggle it around, For example, if we move it to the left, or if we move it, let's try this one. It's moving from where the top of that element is instead of from some other fixed point. Uh, and that's really good because a lot of the times when we have a child element in a parent element, we want it to move with respect to the parent instead of floating off and doing its own thing. So those are the four positions. We had static, which was the default. That one's really boring. It just means stay in place. But static does. So if I remove that, we have position static. Everything is just kind of stayed in its stacked place. If instead we change that to position relative, we now have the freedom to move around things. So for example, this movement of the third element actually goes into play. If instead we change this to fixed, now everything starts at the corner and moves around uh, with respect to this axis right here in the corner. And then finally we have position of absolute, which can only go on a child element of some parent element. Um, and this allows the child to move with respect to the parent that it's contained within um, and stay within it instead of with respect to a different point in the page. So those are our positions. So we have learned about display and position. And for a long time, that was what we had. That Those were the two tools that we had for everything you just learned were the tools that we had for moving around items on a screen. Uh, and it turns out that this is an incredibly complex system. And even sometimes really simple tasks could become really problematic. So let me illustrate that to you with one basic thing. Let me go ahead and clean this up a little bit and put this back to relative. All right, so say I wanted to center the purple box. Well, there's really nothing we learned that's just, you know, I can't put on position center. That doesn't exist. That would be awesome to exist. So what I would have to do is say left and then kind of eyeball it and go 400 pixels. It's not precisely centered, but it looks pretty centered, right? The problem is that it's only centered for this screen specifically. So if I start to squeeze it in, it's not centered anymore. And of course, every screen is different. Every monitor is different. People are looking at things on different devices or using different web browsers. So just moving something over to the left is not a good way to center. And it turns out that centering, which seems like it should be an extremely simple thing, can actually get really convoluted in CSS. So there are a bunch of these problems that came up again and again where really simple intuitive things in CSS seem to require quite a bit of wizardry. Um, but luckily, there was something that was introduced a few years ago called Flexbox that made life so much better. So I am incredibly jealous of you guys that you are learning this in a day and age when Flexbox is a thing because I have this horrifying memory when I was in programming school, which I repressed as best as I could, but you know, I keep having nightmares about just trying to center one element on our homepage and working on this for like four hours and having a complete existential crisis because I felt like I couldn't do even the most basic thing. Uh, but luckily centering is about to get a lot easier because I'm going to show you Flexbox. So I will put these back a little bit and do a couple things here, and then we will be able to jump in and see what Flexbox is. 
Give me one moment. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I got rid of that child element. I've kept my first, second, and third elements. And then I have put them inside of something that I labeled the parent. And this is the basic setup that we want when we're using Flexbox. Flexbox works when we have some sort of parent element that contains multiple children inside of it. And it allows us to do some really cool things to these children with respect to the parent. And I actually am going to go ahead and put a border on the parent just so we can be clear about where that guy is. So let's do. It's kind of hard to see. Let's go ahead and. Sorry, bear with me. I want to make sure that this is really clear so you guys can see exactly what's going on. So I'm going to give all three of these children child class, which as I remember, multiple elements can have the same class, but that's not true with ID. So, and child. Okay, cool. Now we can see what's going on. So we have this big parent div, this big old container with a black border around it, and then inside of it we have these three children, the purple box, the red box, and the green box. So as I mentioned earlier, we use Flexbox with a display property. So the display property always goes on the parent, and it is display flex. Well, that just changed things. So I'm gonna say this one more time because it's really easy to get mixed up on. The display property of flex always goes on the parent. It affects the way that the children interact, which is why it's really easy to get reversed about that. But the display property flex always goes on the parent element. So we probably noticed right out of the box that something just changed. Uh, whereas our elements were stacked before, now all of a sudden they're next to each other. So let's talk about all these cool things that we can do with Flexbox. The first step to understanding Flexbox is thinking about um, is thinking about the axes. So there's two axes at play here. There's the main axis, which we would think of as being like the x-axis, like a, a horizontal line. And then there's something called the cross axis, which is would be the Y, so that you think of that as being like a vertical line. So the main axis defaults to being uh, to being horizontal. The cross axis defaults to being vertical, but we can actually change those. We will see that a little later. And the very first thing that we saw is that these boxes flipped back to being along the main axis. So whenever you're using Flexbox, all of the children elements are along the main axis. So whatever the main axis is, you can tell because the children are kind of stacked along it. So we can see that the main axis here is going to be this horizontal line. So let's talk about some cool things we can do with these different axes. So there is a property called justify content. And justify content affects the behavior along the main axis. So that is going to change what's happening from left to right. So the first thing I wanna show you guys is center, because look at that, all of a sudden we can center in this super easy, convenient way. So they're going to be centered with respect to this parent box that they are all in. So we can center. We can also do something called flex start. Not that exciting because this is the default, so that pushes them to one side. Do flex end. Everything jumps to the end. 
We also have a couple different techniques for uh, spacing our child elements out. The first one I'm going to show you is called space between. So this puts the first one at the very beginning, the last one at the very end, and then evenly spaces between them. So just to give you an idea, if I went ahead and added a fourth child here, so we'll call this fourth. And we'll give fourth a background color of blue. So we see that this idea of spacing them evenly is still occurring. There's, there's less space between them because now we have four elements instead of three, but the main idea still holds. Another way we can space them is something called space around. So in this way, there's um, if you divide, basically what's happening is if you divided this parent container into fourths, because there are four children, each one would be centered in its quadrant. So there's going to be space on each side. The final spacing one is called space evenly. It just makes it so there's an even amount of space between all of them with space on either end. So we have flex start, which moves everything to one side, flex end, other side, flex center, puts them in the middle, and then we can do space between, space around, or space evenly. And as always, these are all documented on W3, so you don't need to memorize them right now. So this is really amazing. Uh, it's, it is kind of hard to appreciate how much of a miracle this is if you've never tried to do this without Flexbox. So if you ever find yourself taking Flex for granted, I suggest you just take 15 minutes to try to build something like this without Flex, and you will very quickly see why Flex is so incredible. So Justify Content allowed us to mess with the positioning and the spacing in terms of this main axis. But let's, I'm gonna go ahead and first center these. I'm so excited that I can do that with just a couple lines of code. And then I'm going to show you something called align items. So as you might have guessed, align items, rather than dealing with the main axis, deals with the cross axis. So in order to see this, I am going to make our parent a little bigger. So let's go ahead and throw a height on this of 500. All right, so the default for align items is flex start, just like the default for justify content. That pushes everything to the top. Flex end pushes everything to the bottom. So once again, we're now working along our cross axis. So the start is the top, the end is the bottom. We can also do center. So there's no spacing that we really do here because there's there's just kind of one chunk here in terms of the cross axis, so there's nothing to space out. So align items is kind of like this watered down version of justify content. We can do start and center, but that's pretty much it. All right, so as I mentioned before, there is an option where we can switch the cross and the main axis, and that is something called flex direction. So flex direction is automatically set to row. That's saying that our row is the main axis, but we could change that to column. So this is where our flex box can get a little dizzying. So do your best to follow along, but just keep in mind that more practice will make this really clear. So now justify content, if I do flex end, is dealing with this um this vertical axis so the vertical axis has become the main axis so flex end on justify content now brings things down if we wanted to bring things all the way over to the right that would be align items and of course as we saw now the orientation of all of our child boxes has flipped because we've changed our flex direction we can also use flex direction to reverse items so if i do row reverse, notice that our colors are flipped. I can do the same thing with column and do column reverse. Now the colors are flipped and blue is first, but they are stacked in a column. 
So that is the nuts and bolts of Flexbox. We have these kind of four, first we set display flex on our parent, yes, our parent, to get us started. And then we have these three properties that allow us to do an incredible amount of things with just a little bit of code. So everything we've talked about has gone directly on the parent. But there are a couple of things that we can do to individual child elements using Flexbox. So these are things that go on the child, uh, on a child element that's inside a parent with flex. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back to row. I'll do center that. Okay, cool. So we're back to this being our main axis. So we're centered along the main axis and then everything's pushed to the end along the cross axis. So let me go ahead and mess with our little first purple friend. So there is something called align self. And this is for all the special snowflake elements that need to go somewhere else. So if I do align self, I can do something familiar, which is flex start. So now all of these items here have been aligned to flex end but then we went ahead and overrode that with line self to say, actually for this first element, do flex start. I can of course also do flex center. Oops, just center. Center or flex end, which in this case doesn't appear to do anything, but notice that if I change this to flex start, this guy stays down here. So align self is a way of moving individual elements that need to move away from the herd for whatever reason. There are a couple other things that we can do on individual elements, ways that we can mess with order, for example, but I'm not gonna go over that tonight. Uh, if you're curious about it, you're welcome to look around in the documentation and learn a little bit more about Flexbox. So that is everything I wanted to show you guys tonight. Let's just do a little quick review. So when it comes to actually positioning our elements, our two most basic tools that we have are display and position. Display affects um, how something appears on the screen, whether or not it's even on the screen or if it's taking up an entire line versus being in line and just taking up as much as, it, as the content requires of it. Then we also have positioning, which allows us to actually move things around and move things around with respect to each other or move things around independently. And finally, I've showed you guys Flexbox, which is this incredible tool that's designed for a situation where you have this parent box containing some sort of set of child elements. And this allows us to space out or rearrange or justify or center all the children elements with respect to the parent. Really incredible tool, really big staple of design in this day and age. So, and as I've said a million times, do not take Flexbox for granted because it is the coolest thing in the world. So that is everything that I have to teach you guys tonight. So we will have time for questions as usual. Um, and then it looks like we'll be able to go a little early. So before I open up to questions, let me just talk about the homework really quick. Hopefully you guys have all are all starting to get the hang of this structure of submitting a pull request when your homework's done and seeing the tests go off. Um, if there's any confusion about how to, well, certainly the content of the homework, but also just this higher level process of submitting the homework once you're done, please reach out in Slack. Uh, I know a couple of people have reached out to me directly. You're always welcome to do that and I'm happy to help, but I'm not always online. So if you want a quicker response, I would say post it in the general or in the questions channel, but you are welcome to message me. And I love to hear from you guys because it makes me feel like I'm actually teaching people instead of just talking at my wall, um, which is what I do the rest of the time is talk at the wall. So it's good to talk to people. Um, all right. So here's lesson three for your homework tonight. You're going to be playing a bit with Flexbox. Um, there's, oh, I really want to point out this because I think it's really cool. This is an additional resource for practicing Flexbox. It's really ridiculous and it involves putting frogs on lily pads. I think it's really great because even if you conceptually understand Flexbox, it's just inevitable at the beginning 
that you get, you know, justify content versus align items reversed. And this resource of Flexbox Froggy is a really good way to just get some practice. You can get them straight. So, all right. This is, um, yeah, so you have some homework where you will be using the tools that we learned tonight. So hopefully you guys feel ready to jump into that. If not, I will go ahead and open up the floor to questions. We've got someone typing, so sit tight for a minute. So Jessica asked uh, a question about the homework, and she was asking if the way to submit homework is for the finished homework to be in a folder in Git. Uh, it depends on what exactly you mean by that, Jessica. So you'll have your homework. When you're working on your homework, it's going to be on your actual machine. There's going to be a hard copy of it on your computer. And then you'll commit it, which is saving it, and you'll push it up to your GitHub. And so at that point, it will actually be on your personal GitHub. So if I went to my own GitHub slash pre-course. Oh, to spell my name right or else this won't work. So if I went to my own copy of pre-course, we would want, you would definitely want finished homework appears in this homework folder on your own page. But that's not quite the last step. So the last step would be to actually do a pull request on it. So you would Go to pre-course and then new pull request. And so if you click on new pull request, that'll actually trigger the test to run. So if you're not seeing any tests, you probably haven't done the very last step. Uh, we had a question about trying the Froggy Flexbox tutorial before the homework. Um, it's really up to you on that one. You know, you do, it's not mandatory that you do that tutorial at all. You could do the homework first, and if you get stuck, then go back and do the tutorial. Or if you're just wanting a little bit of practice before you even jump in, you're welcome to do the tutorial first. And if you do the homework and it all makes perfect sense, then feel free to skip it, unless you feel really compelled to put frogs on lily pads. OK, we've got one more question on the way. Uh, Jordan wants some clarification on the pull request. So what you do is click new pull request. And this is where you set what you're trying to pull it to. So you'll just leave these as the default. And then you have to click actually create pull request. Uh, at that point, you will be done. So it's two steps. You have to start with new pull request. And then you have to actually click the green button, create pull request. And just so you know, if the tests don't pass, you'll want to go through, edit your files, push them back up to GitHub, and then the pull request you already created will automatically update. Any other questions before we head out for the night? All right, CSS masters, go out there and make some stuff look pretty. And once again, if you have any questions along the way, we will be here to help you out. You're welcome to message me directly if you want. But as I said, if you're looking for more immediate feedback, I would recommend just posting in the general channel because there are people available more frequently than I am. All right, that's it for tonight. So tomorrow we are going to start JavaScript, which is a really big, really exciting topic that we will be with for almost the entire rest of the course. So I hope you guys are excited for that, and I will see you guys tomorrow. All right, have a good night.